Good afternoon. Hey. Hi. Looking forward to the next hour with all of you. I want to invite some of the folks who are in the back half of the room to just come on up closer. I want to invite you to come sit in the first three, four, or five rows, all of you, so that you can really engage and hear, because some of this is going to be interactive discussion. We're going to invite you to share questions, thoughts. We've got some roving mics. And I'll feel closer to you, too. So come on up. A little bit more. Come on up, a few more of you. So I'm going to start with a, a little bit of an experimental exercise just to build awareness around the role of white men in diversity and sometimes the role of white women, people of color, and others too. So these first set of statements are directed towards those of you who identify as white men in the room here. And so I'm going to read a statement. If it applies to you, as you interpret it, and you choose to disclose that publicly, the invitation is to just stand in your seat where you are there momentarily and then have a seat again. So again, this is an awareness building exercise. And after seven statements, I'm going to have a set of statements for those you identify more with white, as white women or people of color in the room for a set of statements for you too. Okay? So directed to the white men, please stand silently if you are not sure at times what white women and people of color want from you as a diversity partner. Thank you. Please stand silently if you have witnessed inappropriate or hurtful behavior or comments directed towards white women or people of color but felt unsure what to do or say about it. Thank you. Again, to white men, Please stand silently if you have had difficulty accepting the idea that white men are privileged because you don't feel very privileged yourself. Thank you. Please stand silently if you've had relationships with white women or people of color suffer as a result of trying to discuss diversity issues with them. Please stand silently if you've had few experiences of other white women initiating serious discussions with you or other white men on issues of inclusion and diversity. Few issues of seeing white men initiate discussions. Thank you. And please stand silently if you've had experiences where you and other white men were seen as the problem regarding inclusion and diversity. Thank you. Last one for white men. Please stand silently if you are not sure at times what to do or say for fear of offending or hurting people of color or white women with your statements and or questions. Not sure what to do or say. Thank you. OK. These next set of statements are directed to those of you who identify primarily as white women or people of color. And again, choose to disclose it if, you, if it resonates for you. It's up to you to disclose by standing. Please stand silently if you have felt burden with trying to educate white men about diversity issues in the workplace. Thank you. Please stand silently if you have often heard from white men that they don't see gender or color and just treat everyone the same. Thank you. Please stand silently if you've been afraid of raising diversity issues out of concern about the impact on your career. Thank you. Please stand silently if you've experienced withdrawal of support from white men for taking an unpopular stand about an issue that was important to you as a white woman or person of color. Thank you. Please stand if you've ever questioned the authenticity of some white men's expressed desires to help change the workplace to make it more inclusive. Thank you. 
Please stand if you've ever heard white men question the need for people of color or women's affinity groups or networks and say that affinity groups or networks are negative because they separate people from each other. Thank you. And please stand silently if you have felt that white men expected you to lead on educating them and other white men on diversity issues. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I'd like you to do just for a couple minutes is to turn to somebody near you and talk about what came up for you in, you, in these exercises from what you stood up with or what you observed others stand up with. Just talk to somebody you know or somebody you don't know next to you about what you notice in that last few minutes of exercise there. Take about three minutes. Um, I want to mention twice today. Uh, today, the book I wrote, Four Days to Change, about the process that white men go through in the last 20 years of our work is captured in that book. It's a free Kindle download today on a great publisher called Amazon. <laughs> so just search Four Days to Change. What's that? <laughs> it's free today. So. Help yourself if you want the Kindle. So in 1990, I traveled to South Africa. I had spent 10 years before that working for Outward Bound as an instructor, canoe trips, dog sledding trips in Minnesota. And I got the chance to go to Lesotho in Southern Africa and work for Outward Bound. It was a life-changing experience for me. Nelson Mandela had just been released from prison six months before I went there. I worked with these eight day long courses with mining groups, banks, pharmaceutical companies coming from all over South Africa to work on interracial team building. These folks worked in the same shifts together, but in the mining groups, which were those groups were all men, they didn't drink beer together, they didn't have meals together, they didn't sleep in the same dorm rooms, and yet they worked in the same shifts together. I remember one white man said, my wife said, if I sleep in the same room as a black man, she'll divorce me. There was a lot of pressure to keep separate. And so in, a ten, in an eight-day course, they had quite a transformative experience. Often within minutes, we would do these kind of team building activities just to break the norms instantly and then reinforce that. And they often discovered they had a lot more in common with uh, each other than they realized. At first, I connected with the women, <coughs> the people of color, different tribal groups who spontaneously would sing and dance around the campfire an amazing ability, and over time I'm like, you know, these white guys, they're just like me, good guys, and yet when I look at it, they're in power, others are conforming to their system, and I looked into the eyes of the white men in South Africa and I saw myself, and I said, I need to come back to the US and work with people like me, other white men. So I came back and I started seven years of research about how do white men learn about diversity? And uh, I studied the learning journeys of a bunch of white men and I came to some conclusions, and I was presenting those results to them. And one of the things I found was that we learn almost everything from women, people of color, and white women and others, and we don't look to other white men. Sometimes they would disconnect from white men and just be kind of angry at that group. Well, I remember a black woman stood up at this conference. She said, you know, if that's the pathway to diversity for white men, I'm exhausted. I don't have the energy to educate all of you. <laughs> some of you can recognize that. So it's... it's uh, it's a pattern that often plays out. And so one of my colleagues, who was also an Outward Bound instructor, Bill Proudman, he said, well, let's take white men, put them in the room for four days, and focus on ourselves. Instead of looking at other people's experiences, let's get connected to what's it mean to be white and male, and for many of us, heterosexual. And so we've been doing that for 20 years. So we found oh, essentially three things that white men don't know. We don't know that we're part of a group and that we have a culture. We don't know that others are having a really different experience in the world than us. And we don't know that the process of learning those first two things is transformative and life-changing for us. And we benefit as many as well as other people benefit. So I'm gonna talk about these three things for a little bit. First, we don't know that we're part of a group and that we have a culture. So when I look in the mirror, I see Michael, I don't see a white male typically, I just see myself. I was working with a SWAT team member um, from Minnesota and 
he came back from his learning process, his caucus, and the first day on the job, he said, I was able to avoid a situation that usually ends in a fight or an arrest. And he essentially realized that he is an individual, and he sees himself as an individual, but other people see him as a group. And this angry person of color was yelling at him, and um, they saw him as a white male and reflective of the other white men that they've dealt with who are police officers. He was able to see that paradox and say, this person doesn't know me. They are looking at me as part of a group. And he was able to shift out of being defensive and reaction, and he was able to use inquiry, curiosity, and turn a situation that usually ends in a fight into a partnership. He got really curious and asked the man what his experiences have been. So thinking about myself as part of a group, not just only as an individual, helps me shift how I can respond to others as well. And it helps me know how others can see me too. So this is partly a result, us not seeing ourselves as a group, as how diversity has been framed. So here's four dimensions of many dimensions of diversity. And when we think about race, who do we usually focus on and talk about? What's the conversation about? Blacks, Latino, Asian, people of color. When we talk about gender, who do we usually focus on and talk about? Who's, who's got a guess? <laughs> Women, right? Um, we went over to an oil company in Europe, and uh, they wanted to break the glass ceiling for gender. And they spent a whole year rolling out a state-of-the-art leadership program for women. And at the 11th hour, they paused and they said, wait a minute, maybe there's something we need to do with the men on how the men partner with the women. And so often, diversity is focused on in that middle column, and this other column over there is unexamined, unex and we don't, therefore, see ourselves as connected into diversity. And so diversity gets seen as about the center column there, people of color, women, LGBT, um, and other dimensions too that are sometimes outsiders. And so thus what we created in terms of the focus on white men is to expand that middle column to say, as white men, in our role of diversity, we need to first understand how we are as white men. Do we have a culture? Do we have a different experience in the world than others have in and out of work? And therefore, how can we partner better with knowing more about those blind spots, potentially? And so there's, we call the, our company White Men as Full Diversity Partners to force that right-hand column to be examined and looked at. The other thing that white men don't realize often is that we're like a fish in water. We don't realize we have a culture. If you ask that fish, how's the water, what's it going to say? What water, right? Yeah. And you take the fish out of the water, right? It's like, oh, that water, put me back in. And so <clears throat> we're like, we never have to often leave our culture. If my culture permeates schools, businesses, government agencies, everywhere I grow up, even churches, I don't think of it as a culture. I just think about it as being universal human. Oh, those folks over there, they have a culture, but I don't have a culture. And so we wouldn't say to the Japanese, you don't have a culture. But we might think about ourselves as not having a culture, or somehow it's vanilla, or it's just a rough American culture. So examining what that cultural norm is and understanding it. And so I love my culture as a white male. And I've noticed that sometimes I overuse some of those strengths, and they become a weakness when I overuse them. But they are incredible strengths. They've created a lot of success uh, across our country. So what are some of those characteristics? These are some of the tenets. This does not describe all of these. And you can think about which of these resonate in your organization, which of these show up. Rugged individualism, that sense that I can make it on my own, that sense of Marlboro man, John Wayne ethos. Anybody know white guys who get lost and don't ask for directions? It's like somehow it's seen as a weakness to need help or ask for help or to say, I don't know. That pressure to always have the answer. But also individualistic culture is part of our American culture compared to other cultures which are more collectivist in notion. We say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Stand up if you got something to say. Other cultures, some Asian cultures, 
say the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Or in Russia, they say the blade of grass that sticks up gets mowed off. And so the mocha's focus on collectivism. I was in Morocco last week eating uh, meals with a traditional Moroccan family, and they had a common plate. They had one common plate that everybody ate from, as opposed to our individual plates on that. Low tolerance of uncertainty, that sense. This is something that you know all your processes, cloud computing and everything, better work with low, no uncertainty, right? Better be actually work. You're, you all want that to work. And yet, when it comes to diversity, there's a lot of uncertainty. As one guy said, I don't know whether to open the door for women or not open the door for women. I've been chewed out for both. Which is it? As wish we could take it down to a set of rules on our wallet cards and say, here's the 10 things to do, here's the 10 things not to do. We can't simplify it into that much. But there is a tendency in this cultural trait of Calvinistic thinking to be sort of seeing things in black white. Is it this or is it this? Which is not leading us to think yes and yes. We'll get into that a little bit more. Action over reflection. So we get value by seeing ourselves as fixing, problem solving, uh, have that clear muscle to do things. And doing is where I have value as opposed to being or reflecting. And so we identify ourselves, introduce ourselves. Hi, Michael, I'm a consultant. We identify ourselves by what we do. Other cultures in the world might say, my parents are so and so. I'm from such and such village. There's a lot of sense of connectedness into that. Uh, I got to get things done, action orientation. And again, not saying that's bad. Sometimes we can overuse that muscle. Anybody ever have to say to your male or your white male spouse, I don't want you to fix this. I just want you to listen. Yeah. You ever hear that feedback? So again, these traits are awesome traits. They create a lot of success, and it's noticing when I might overuse them. Rationality over emotion. This low tolerance of uncertainty has us think, I'm either rational or I'm emotional, but I can't do both at the same time. And since I get a lot of credibility by being rational and having data, I better leave my emotions behind. Other cultures in the world don't say that or don't lead you to do that and see you as being able to do both. But that can happen sometimes. It's like I just disconnect from the emotions and stick with what gives me credibility. Time is linear and future focused. We're burning daylight. Let's move. Put a man on the moon. Create the future together. There's other cultures that value the past much more or value the present much more. Or see time as cyclical and not so tight linearly. Don't let time control everything. And finally, status and rank over connection. So Deborah Tannen talks about this. So men, <clears throat> from a linguist perspective, pay more attention to this is an interaction that it means more about whether I'm higher or lower in the hierarchy. And in her research, women notice an interaction about am I closer or farther apart? And so I might pay attention to status and rank. Or as a team of men, I might sit down and use smack talk, as one person said, or bantering to kind of connect and play with the status and rank. So you might think about these traits and which of these traits show up, which is OK if they show up, but also which might we overuse at times and they get in our way. So just turn back to a colleague again and talk about which of these traits do you see as some of the fish water swimming in that water in your organization or in AWS's organization or other organizations that you deal with? And how might that be effective? How might that be limited? to who can fit that box, OK? A couple minutes with a colleague. Which of these do you see in your organization? OK. Let's hear a few thoughts, reactions. We've got some mics that will run around. Just raise your hand if you've got a comment. Um, you want to share whether those resonated or not. Whatever you see or feel reactions is absolutely valid. There's no right answer here. We can have totally disagreeing perspectives in the room. I was having a conversation with the, the two gentlemen next to me. And uh, well, yeah. at least one, yeah, we agree that that's not just, I think we do, right? Yes. Okay. That um, some of those, <laughs> um, some of those are not just white male culture. Yes. Um, these two gentlemen, um, black man, French, Gentlemen, mm -hmm. they yeah. can see some of those in there. Yes, them. yes. Yeah. And that's a, layer, that's a layer of complexity around culture when you describe 
a particular culture doesn't mean other cultures don't have that particular trait. The, in black culture, you might have more presence of emotion than in white male culture, but some other characteristics might actually be the action oriented as well. So there might be some sameness and difference across that. A lot of white men across Europe resonate a lot with these traits in our experience over the years too. Thanks. I wanted to share um, that our little group over here had a really similar reflection as to what the woman up front just described. Uh -huh. And what we realized, or what we, we think we realized, is that for us, um, we're, we were all taught a lot of these. Yeah. And we were taught these with the explicit purpose of excelling in American business culture. Right. And then we noted, well, who invented that? Yeah. Right? Where did that really come from? Mm -hmm. And then we noticed that we ourselves are, are taught to swim in the same water. That's right. Yeah, I remember the first time we presented these six traits to Shell Oil executives, the first words out of their mouth were, well, that's our performance appraisal system. <laughs> Individual goals, total action oriented, no uncertainty, and that it gets embedded as a definition of success for everybody. So it looks like it's everybody's culture. But yeah, when you look back at who founded the original pieces, there is a discrepancy there, yeah. But it's, it's what, what looks like a qualified leader gets um, sort of cast as a model for everybody, and including white men. Not every white man, man fits into this box as well. Over here. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when I look at some of this, and then I look at this room, right, the individualism yeah. and the lack of connection, right, shows in just the dispersal of people and uh -huh. the fact that there, you know, near me there are these two people, um, and really no one else to to connect with to talk to about these things. Yeah that even how we are dispersed in the room shows our sense of not tight community, but sort of dispersed. Some folks wanted to stay in the back, others around. So yeah, it's interesting. Sir. Uh, in, in my journey in my life, I'm doing a lot of work like digging back through my childhood and figuring out like what it was I went through as I grew up. And, and a lot of these values are, are resonating with me as things that like um, the antithesis of these values were actively discouraged or shamed. Yeah. That right. um, you know, if I lean more on my emotions than my reason, then you know I mm -hmm. was being dramatic or you know too sensitive. If I yep. um, you know was not focused on status and rank, then I was being disrespectful. If I was not mm -hmm. uh, future focused, then you know I had no direction in my life. And so all these things, as a boy, I was literally actively discouraged from right. viewing the world in any other way. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting seeing these laid out like this because all of it's very resonant. Yeah, that's great. And, and to look at that and how, how has that kept me in a box in a way that's um, blocked me from owning some of my humanness. You know, permission to ask for help, permission to be confused, permission to be messy, um, permission to not always be able to fix something. All, all those pieces and the parts of me I left behind, what parts of those might actually be more helpful at work and in home, too? Um, we had uh, one guy on the last day of his caucus, he role played practicing apologizing to his son. Because the week before the caucus, his son said, you know, he came home from school, he was crying, he was bullied. He said, I was bullied at school. And, you know, the guy said, the father said, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I told you to suck it up and not uh, cry, and now I've gone through and I'm realizing after this caucus that I've just taught you to stay in that box too. And I want you to come to me and ask for help, and it's okay to feel whatever you feel. So yeah, what do we reinforce uh, in that? And so I think those models are under a big change. There's been a big change for women over the last several decades. I think men are in some ways catching up into what's our corresponding change and the permission to be more vulnerable, permission to ask for help, seeing vulnerability as a strength instead of a weakness. Thanks. Another, is there any other mics out there? Any questions, comments? Great. Good, good insights. So I've uh, worked for military organizations for the last yeah. 15 years, and so definitely the status and rank, but yeah. um, I've also noticed that on the emotion side, it's okay to get angry, it's okay to yell right. in meetings, it's okay to pound the table. It is not okay to be, cry mm -hmm. or show vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah, and so looking at what particular emotions are allowed for men, being anger more and the more vulnerable emotions often aren't, haven't been allowed. Um, 
generations have reflected differently on presidents who tear up and cry, and it's more accepted for some to hug each other and things. So some of that is changing to some degree. But yeah, and women might have more permission to have vulnerable emotions, but might be judged harshly with anger as opposed to men, oh, he's assertive, versus a woman does the same behavior and is, as double standards, judged differently, more harshly. So that's all the part of the complexity of our partnerships. And as a man, it's helpful for me to know how are others judged differently than me, too. Are there other mics? Yeah, great. We got um, the back. What's yeah. the back got to say? Hi. Back to the room. So, um, by the way, I just wanted to comment. So we're from Sweden. Ah. Uh, and actually, these points also apply in Sweden, even though we're kind of known yeah. as the country Thank of equality. Thank you. Um, it's true. <laughs> so when I see all these points, for me, in a, on a company uh, perspective, it looks like it's just cost uh, efficiency, right? Like all of these is about how do you increase delivery, how, mm -hmm. yeah, Task how you doing. just you make sure you not you don't waste time and ultimately yeah. you don't waste money. So right. if you add the cost aspect to it, how can you like I don't know? It, are you going to basically explain that there's better ways to? save cost while not having this very mm -hmm. white male culture? Well, what comes up for me when you say that is sometimes we jump to conclusions and sometimes we jump into action without collecting all the data or without reflecting on what has failed in the past before we repeat it. And we end up paying later for that price versus yeah. some cultures slow down and plan more and reflect more. And it may look like they're slow but they can accelerate later because they've given more time for learning in that early process versus we got to go, we got to get to market, we got to go, you know. So, so ultimately, it would be about training companies to not be afraid of taking time uh, right. to look back and... Right. To where, where does that linear sense of time almost get out of control in a way that harms our process, um, whether it's safety, productivity, quality, or inclusion, uh, anything like that. So again, we're not saying any of these qualities are simply bad. They are some of the root causes of success, but we want to be more conscious of them in terms of where do we use them in a way that serves us and where do we overuse them at times that may get in our way. Thank you. Thanks. Any others? You got that mic. So a couple more thoughts about this. Was there another? You know. In terms of how this connects to unconscious bias, if I operate from this, to me as a white male, invisible to me cultural lens or box or operating software, however you want to see it, that lens that I don't even know I have might drive who I see as qualified or promotable in the organization. Do they look like a, another white guy who typically who is fast and operating you know, linear and rational and um, how do I actually mentor people? Do I actually mentor people unconsciously to be like me? Um, some people that don't fit that box might be overlooked or might not be hired or might not be seen as promotable. Um, they might be, feel like they're forced to fit in to uh, demonstrate these qualities to be seen as qualified. Other qualities might be overlooked that may actually be valuable as well. And me, as a white guy, I might hide those parts of myself that don't fit in, the confusion part of me or the other parts that are asking for help. And so we conform to that box, too. This can restrict us. Um, so this is about seeing the water that we swim in and just not trying to draw you to have the same exact conclusion of all six traits, but for all of you to be on your process of thinking about what is the dominant culture in my organization how does that serve us to success, and where do we overuse some of those strengths? So second thing that white men don't know, we don't know that others are having a different experience in the world. And we think about another paradox here of sameness and difference. It's very natural for people to want to connect on sameness. Oh, yeah, we have that in common. Oh, you like golf, or you like surfing, whatever it is. And we often miss how another is having a different experience in the world because we are trying to connect on a natural ground of sameness if we can find some. 
Research interculturally shows that people initially deny differences or minimize differences before accepting and appreciating differences. And so if I only connect with you as another human on what I think of as the sameness we have, I miss part of your world that's different. And it's not that my view of the world is wrong, it's more likely incomplete. So can I see the sameness and the difference? Um, my business colleague and I were going to present a session in Kalamazoo, Michigan, to executives. Well, we were flying into O'Hara in the summer. Thunderstorms canceled. The whole airport closed. And by the time I got there, all the rental cars were gone, and all the flights to Kalamazoo were canceled or gone, booked. My colleague Bill landed in Rockford. He talked this taxi driver into taking him all the way to O'Hara, the guy had never been out of Rockford before. And when we got to O'Hara, he had propositioned him to take us all the way to Kalamazoo. We drove through the night, got into Kalamazoo at 2.30 AM. And you know what happened? At 7.30 the next morning, we were in front of those executives, proud, telling them our planes, trains, and automobiles story of failure's not an option. We're going to get there no matter what. There was one woman on that team. She said, I would have never gotten in that taxi. I would have never driven across rural America with, str with a stranger driving in places I didn't know. And I would not have told the team that the next day. I would have made up an excuse so you wouldn't think I'm a team player. Well, I looked at Bill. I looked at uh, the group. And I said, I never thought of that as an example of male privilege until you mentioned that. And I teach this stuff. So sometimes we don't see the differences that the things that I don't have to navigate. That, so for example, as a woman, she has to navigate a whole different level of safety than me generally feeling safe. And so <clears throat> I might say, I don't see color. I don't see gender. I just treat everybody the same. But if I do that, I might not be seeing some of the differences and know how to partner across those differences. So we call some of this examination of difference through a lens of what we call systemic advantage or privilege. And here's a definition. Often invisible, unacknowledged, unearned benefits that come to a person or a membership in an insider group, the group that's the norm, and is made to look available to everybody. So for instance, most of us appearingly to be able-bodied in this room did not have to navigate or figure out whether we had a hard time navigating in a wheelchair through the lobby, up through the systems, into your rooms, out of your rooms, from the other hotels or wherever you came from. That does not make us bad people, but being temporarily able-bodied, perhaps, and there may be some people here that actually aren't, but appearingly that, we don't have to navigate that. We don't have to be conscious of that. That is what I call able-bodied privilege. It's not a problem, but if I'm not aware I have that, I'm not aware of others having a different experience in the world. Systemic advantage or privilege is not so much what I have and don't have, but what I don't have to deal with or think about or navigate daily. So thinking about privilege, all of us receive some privilege from being in the insider group, which could go as broad as for some of you being English speaking primarily, or American born, or any Christian, or lots of different insider group parts. Having it doesn't make us a problem. It's often not something we chose. And it can be impede me from seeing what, how others are living in a different world and dealing with other challenges that I don't have to. So I might assume sameness when actually there's some other things going on for others to navigate. So how can I get, become aware of privilege and actually use it honorably? For instance, if a woman says an idea in a meeting and a man repeats it a few minutes later and another guy, the leader, says, that's a great idea, Bill, I can say as another male, actually, that was Jody's idea, Good idea, Jody. I can use my privilege honorably to include others and bring others in. So we're going to look at some more examples of this. I've got some cards. And I'm going to walk around the room with one of these mics and hand out some cards one at a time, invite you, if you're willing, to read it out loud. And just notice the cumulative nature of these privilege examples I'm only going to read maybe we'll read 15 examples of white privilege, some male examples, and some hetero for now. And just notice these. And we're going to suspend conversation and just react to hearing them. Thanks. 
we can bring up the light a little bit. So these first ones are white privilege. Is this on? Okay. So go ahead and read that out loud if you're willing to. I can go shopping without being harassed, followed, or suspected of wanting to steal something. Thanks. When I'm told about our national heritage or about civilization, I am shown that people of my race made it what it is. Thanks. I can go into a hairdresser or barber shop and find someone who can cut my hair. Thanks. I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical safety. I can express my views in public without creating damaging perceptions of my race. Thanks. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. Thanks. If the police pull me over, I can be pretty sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. Thank you. I can easily buy posters, magazines, books, greeting cards, dolls, and toys featuring people of my race. Thanks. I can go home from most meetings of organizations I belong to feeling somewhat connected, rather than isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, held at a distance, or feared because of the color of my skin. Thanks. I can take a job with an affirmative action employer without having my coworkers on the job suspect that I got it because of my race. I can be late to a meeting without having the lateness reflect on my race. I can be pretty sure I will never be asked, do you speak English or be told, do you speak English very well? Yes. I want to leave you all in the back, huh? My race is conditioned to history. It's not consensed into one chapter or only focused one for one month. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Other people of my race can fail in positions they are ill-suited for, and it does not impact how others view my qualifications for a similar position. Thank you. One more for that white, examples of white privilege. When I move to a new position, I do not have to worry about, I do not worry about having to prove my expertise over again. I take my past successes with me. Thank you. These next examples are male privilege examples. Thanks. I am judged less for the attractiveness of my appearance. Thanks. I can walk the streets without being gawked at, whistled at, catcalled, harassed, or attacked because of my gender. I can take up more space, get more respect, and be listened to more often than a woman. Thank you. My weight, hairstyle, and fashion sense don't negatively impact how my competence or work is valued. I am rarely, if ever, judged on the cleanliness or neatness of my house. I can walk into a car repair shop, hardware, or electronic store and usually expect someone to answer my questions without being condescended to or patronized. Thanks. I don't make sure, sorry, I don't make, sure that my house or car keys are in my hands before I unlock my house, apartment, or car door at night. Thanks. If I'm in a bad mood, show emotion or discipline someone, comments don't circulate about it, being that time of the month. Thanks. I don't have to deal with the debilitating effects or distractions caused by hot flashes during a critical business meeting or presentation. Thanks. Thanks. 
I don't have to expend much time or energy to ensure my travel arrangements help me avoid the threat of rape or sexual violence due to my gender. Thanks. My ability to function effectively during crisis is not questioned because of my gender. It is rare that someone assumes that I am the office assistant at business meetings I attend. My body belongs to me. My reproductive organs are not seen as the property of other men, the government, and or even strangers because of my gender. Thanks. I can be loud without fear of being called a shrew. I can be aggressive without fear of being called a bitch. Thank you. If I buy a new car, chances are I'll be offered a better price than a woman buying the same car. Thanks. These last ones are heterosexual privilege examples. I can express affection with my partner in public without fear of physical violence, bashing, or verbal intimidation. Thanks. My children don't have to worry about which of their friends might reject them because of my sexual orientation. I can expect paid leave from work and or condolences when grieving the death of my partner, lover, spouse. Thank you. I can easily find a religious community that will not exclude me for being heterosexual. Thanks. I can have friendships with or work around children without being accused of recruiting or molesting them. I don't have to be worried that my expression of love and caring for my partner will be considered blatant, outrageous, or offensive. Thanks. I can freely talk about what I did over the weekend or on vacation without hiring or denying my family arrangements. Thank you. I don't have to agonize or worry about how to explain my sexual orientation to my children or their teachers. People assume my primary relationship includes love and caring. They don't just focus on the sexual aspects of my partnership. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oops. I can bring my partner to company functions and off-site events to which spouses and significant others are invited without the risk of it negatively affecting my career. Thanks. A few more. I can ask others if they are married, have kids, or other conversational questions without considering that it may be difficult for them to respond because of their sexual orientation. I can have a picture of my life partner on my desk at work without the risk of it negatively affecting my career or relationships with coworkers. I did, I did not grow up with games that attack my sexual orientation i.e. fag tag or smear the queer. I am more likely to see sexually explicit images of people of my sexuality without these, these images provoking public consternation or censorship. I can work in traditionally male or female dominated occupations without it being considered natural for someone of my sexual orientation. Thank you for reading all those. So if you would just turn to a colleague and just talk about how did those statements impact you, hearing all 45 of those examples. Just uh, whatever reaction you had, just notice that and share that with a, another colleague. Take about two minutes. And let's wrap up our conversations for now. Well, who has a comment, reaction, thought you'd like to share in the large group? Just raise your hand. We'll grab the microphone. Who has a comment willing to share a reaction to hearing those? Got a hand over here, too. So I found myself sad and mad right and then appreciative yeah. of the, the ecosystems that I, that I live in. My company is incredibly supportive of nice. all flavors of diversity. And I happen to go to, uh, I happen to belong to a religious group that is also incredibly open and aware, yeah. and having a dialogue about mm -hmm. um, all of these things, all of these things, and, and examining privilege. But they are bubbles. They're they're another water place mm -hmm. where 
it, it can be easy to forget that yeah. you're in a place where people are accepted and when you walk outside the door, they're mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I felt like you felt, did she just leave? Um, no, she's here. It makes me want to throw up. Just wow. living in a world where, because mm. you hear this stuff, you hear yeah. tidbits. Um, mm. To get it all at once is super upsetting. Mm. I have a 10 year old daughter, mm -hmm. and it, the hardest thing for us, my wife and I, is explaining even a sliver of this to her. Sure. So that she understands, yeah. Yeah. you know, A, what she's against, and B, mm -hmm. what she's up against growing up, and B, yeah. B what someone else's experience might be mm -hmm. so that's all great yeah it's sad it's about interrupting the innocence of well, you know the world thank you and i appreciate you modeling sharing your emotion feeling disturbed and frustrated upset as another man thank you yeah i was sharing with the um small caucus mm -hmm. to my left and right here <laughs> and the, um i work with i work in a retail company with a tech department in the digital department in new uh -huh. york city yeah, we expected to have a lot more, um, a lot more awareness of diversity. Yeah, and fewer surprises of people of different lifestyles and different ethnicities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was sharing a story how we had a, a talented calendar come in uh, for an engineering firm. I mean, engineering role, and um, our head of our people operations or HR is openly gay because we have an open LGBT club. Mm -hmm. uh, it's open diversity within the company. A candidate refused the interview. Uh, if you was working an interview with someone who was gay, mm -hmm. and yeah. that was in New York City, so but it's it's kind of again also like the young lady mentioned the bubbles of people who are not just open but are open to understanding others sure. that they work with, yeah, and that kind of at least helped bring out people's awareness that like, that's mm -hmm. this little bubble needs to grow, yeah, and that like right. degree of intolerance is just it's something that we build into the overall philosophy mm -hmm. and culture right. of the company, so it's it Great. pissed me off. But it's, um, it was good to understand that the coworkers realize that that's, we're better off without people like that coming into our organization. Mm -hmm. People have a choice, and I think Amazon's interested in creating partnerships out with, your, with all of you as customers to model these inclusion aspects. A few more comments, and I've got some clo another couple slides to share. So my initial reaction to the statements being read was, not a lot of shock, mm -hmm. but um, the one thing that dawned on me as the statements were being read is the folks who sit at the intersection of some of those um, categories. Mm -hmm. So if you're not just queer, not just black, but you're black and queer, it's like even worse. Right. The cumulative nature of all of those can be exhausting, yes, to have to navigate those, deal with those all the time. And it's easier for us to see the privileges that others have that we don't, and not necessarily see the privileges that we have. You know, you might, white women sometimes are very clear about the male privileges men have, but don't see the white privilege that they have, for example. And so it's like, we have to learn to see the privileges we have. Somebody back there? Yeah. Okay. I, hi. Um, I was born and raised in Nigeria, and I moved to the U.S., and I was just explaining to the folks around me that I'm teaching my children, I have three children, how to be black in America. Yeah. Because I had to learn that. Right. Because in Nigeria, it's a majority black country of 170 million people. Mm -hmm. I never thought there was anything wrong with being black. Then when I came here, I had to learn what it means to be black here. Mm -hmm. And then so my children now say to me, Mom, why are the, all the b bad guys black, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have to explain to them what it means to be black in America. And mm -hmm. it's, also, it's really fascinating to learn that and also then try to teach that, right. given that I, wasn't originally, mm -hmm. I didn't originally learn this. And it's different than the conversation I have with my white daughters, too. Um, one more comment, and then I've got a few things to say as our timer winds down, about a minute and a half. Um, I'm just wondering, um, is, is the answer to that basically having empathy? Because uh, this hasn't been mentioned, right? 
And so it's basically when, when we don't realize the privileges we have, is it because we're lacking this empathy or is, is it? Well, by definition, we don't have to be conscious of them. We don't have to think about them. There's plenty of things in all of our lives that we have to focus on. So it's, it's not necessarily about having negative intent or being lazy. It might relate to lack of empathy. It might not. But um, I'm tracking what I have to pay attention to, to 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 survive or thrive and not noticing what others are having to pay attention to. But others can assume that we see our privilege and assume that we're just trying to hoard our power or we don't care. So others can project negative intent onto white men or others um, around their privilege and to realize actually we're actually blind to it often for the most part. And so if you assume we just have negative intent, you might, that might get in your way of partnering with us. So we all have work to do. And you can say, who's responsible for educating whites about our white privilege? Is it people of color? That's pretty exhausting. Is it women educating men? So what's the role of us in the insider groups to educate ourselves in our own group about our privilege? So the last thing that th white men don't know um, that learning all this benefits us too. It's not about helping other people with their issues only. Um, we learn that outside of the rugged individualistic culture part, it's okay to make a mistake, to be confused, to share authentically about what we understand and are confused about around diversity. We can choose to use our cultural strengths and to step out of it when it serves us better or others better to be more vulnerable, to be connected to head and heart at the same time, to reflect more without trying to fix something we don't understand. And I find some, some wives have sent men thank you, the, the company thank you notes for the white men changing. They're like, my husband listens better. And actually, most white men listen about a third better, according to the research on the impact of some of the sessions like this. So it's like we get freed from our cultural box and we can take on what we see as some of these eight critical leadership skills that are our effective balance to um, the white male culture box. The courage to not just be, um, tell our truth and to be vulnerable at the same time, to be in our head and heart, to listen without trying to fix or debate, but just to understand, to see those paradoxes, the, bold, the whole picture, to sit with messiness and ambiguity, to have difficult conversations and so, sort of understand how I'm impacting people regardless of my intent as a way to build partnership. To see systemically and not just, hey, we're all individuals. I just treat everybody the same. But to see the differences that make a difference much more beyond race and gender, including introversion, extroversion, what functional group you're at, what differences are making a difference in terms of people feeling in, having a voice, and having appreciated, being appreciated. And being an agent of change is practicing all these skills. So those are the skills that um, give some balance to the overuse of white male culture. <clears throat> I wrote Nelson Mandela a letter three months before he died, three years before he died. I said, I was astounded that you turned to your white male captors and engaged them from a place of love. Um, it's the same thread of love that I carry to other white men around the world with my message. And I want all of us in the room to carry that same thread of love to engage others in understanding these issues more. Don't forget the free Kindle download if you want. Thanks for joining in and the conversation. And I think we're wrapping up. Feel free to come up if you have other questions for me. Thank you.